all, and uh, welcome to um, uh, the Ethnic Minority Liberal Democrats uh, Fringe event. Um, and it's entitled, uh, We're Next for Multiculturalism. But the title, however, is a little misleading because what we're actually talking about is the government's Prevent 2 strategy uh, on tackling extremism and promoting community cohesion. And the idea, really, about all of this is, is, is what impact will all of this have on the notion of multiculturalism. And my name is Isan Ghazni. I'm the chair of Ethnic Minority Liberal Democrats. I would like to welcome here today um, Andrew Stunnell, who is one of our leading ministers. Uh, he is the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for the Department of Communities and Local Government. And correct me if I'm wrong, Andrew, um, Andrew is also responsible for community cohesion, race equality, the big society, and housing and regeneration. Is that correct, Andrew? Single-handed. Single-handed. Needlework? <laughs> Excellent. And Andrew is with us for uh, part of this session, because Andrew has another fringe event that he has to attend. So we'll try and get... Um, uh, your contribution in very quickly, Andrew, and then some Q&As as well. Um, now also, we're very um, honoured to have with us um, someone who I uh, am a big fan of, and she doesn't know that, but I am, um, uh, Yasmin Alibai Brown, and we're very, very grateful for, for you giving your time to us here today. Yasmin, as everyone in the room I'm sure knows, uh, is, is a well-known and respected journalist, uh, regular columnist on, uh, in, uh, in the Independent and, and the London Evening Standard, uh, radio and television broadcaster and author of several books. Um, so welcome, Ayadne. Thank you for coming. I'm not going to spend too much time laying out the um, uh, laying out the context, and the reason for that is that Andrew has got to leave. So what I'd rather uh, sort of do is ask Andrew to make a small contribution and then we'll follow on with Yasmin and then we'll open up the debate. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Okay, um, well, first of all, thanks very much, Isan, and uh, uh, like you, I feel rather uh, privileged to be on the same platform as Yasmin. I'm a little bit concerned, really, to be honest. <laughs> um, uh, a couple of times I've been introduced as the, as the minister responsible for faith, and I, you know, I, I, the, the, the titles you get as a minister are not very closely connected to what the real world is like. And uh, so I'm not responsible for social cohesion. What I am responsible for is the, the government's approach to social cohesion and uh, for making sure that uh, across departments we have something which is reasonably joined up. And you said, Isan, by way of introduction, that this was about prevent to and social cohesion. And in a way, that is exactly the problem we're trying to get to grips with, because prevent, uh, the old program of prevent, which was uh, preventing violent extremism is what it stood for, um, and was a very knee-jerk uh, expenditure of money by the Labour government to tackle uh, domestic terrorism and to neutralise it in some way. Um, it became seen as being what the government's policy was on social cohesion. The two things were seen as being the same thing. In other words, fixing the Muslim problem, and I want you to see the uh, quote marks there, uh, fixing the Muslim problem was seen as the route to social cohesion. And uh, a large part of what we've been doing in government over the last 18 months is trying to unscramble that extremely uh, unhelpful and counterproductive uh, linkage uh, in policy makers' minds just as much as in the minds of some of the uh, minority and for that matter majority communities uh, outside uh, of the government arena. Um, and about three months ago now the Home Secretary announced uh, the uh, current government's um, uh, prevent strategy, <coughs> prevent to as you described it, which is uh, not such a shotgun thing as the old prevent. Um, I've got an illustration which I've used a lot of times, and I apologise if you've all heard it before, but the way prevent money was allocated to areas under the last government was to look at the 2001 census and see how many people had ticked the box as Muslim and to give each local authority money in proportion to their Muslim population. Um, 
Now, as a, as a mechanism for distributing money to prevent terrorism, it was kind of not very well focused, you can see. And in the specific case of Stockport, which is my uh, home authority, we got, uh, I think it was £140,000, because that's how many Muslims we had. And of course, we're completely baffled as to what you could spend it on. Anyway, I can report that we've got an excellent children's playground. <laughs> and as far as I know, none of the people who've used it have subsequently turned to terrorism. So <laughs> it, it has proved to be pretty effective. But you, you see, you see the problem uh, that there was, and of course, there was, a, there was a, there were problems everywhere that you looked. Quite reasonably, Muslim communities, with an S, there's not a Muslim community, lots of different Muslim communities. Muslim communities quite reasonably thought this was an unfair stigmatization of their communities. Uh, and on the other hand, some minority communities which weren't getting any money spent on their area were saying, well, hang on a minute, would it help if we let off a few bombs? Could we have some money? Utterly counterproductive way of approaching the problem. Now, of course, it's very easy to criticize, and indeed the select committee before the election, um, the Home Affairs Select Committee, uh, absolutely panned this program. So the, the criticism and the analysis is very easy to make. The question is what you do instead. And that didn't prove to be as easy to fix. Uh, and what we produce now is Prevent 2. And I, uh, it is a home office program. It's not a Department of Communities and Local Government program. But it's one on which it is agreed we have oversight so that we don't get something which runs away with itself um, but is connected back to a much broader understanding of what we're trying to achieve with social cohesion. And um, social cohesion is a much bigger issue than just whether we've got to uh, deal with some young men, principally young men who are alienated in some small numbers in some Muslim communities. Um, and I make the point that every time there's an EDL march from one of my deprived working class white estates, a coachload of men go to an EDL march. Now, the lack of social <coughs> cohesion isn't confined to the minority communities. It's bang there in that white working class estate. And part of what uh, we are working on, very intensively working on, is getting the whole idea about what we mean by tackling social cohesion, improving social cohesion, to get everybody, uh, minority communities, but also white communities, indigenous communities, I suppose we should say, uh, to look beyond social cohesion being an, a polite way of saying that we need to fix some difficult race relations, to a much more focused approach to alienated communities of all sorts. And bearing in mind that lots of people happen to be members of ethnic minority groups that are not alienated. And I mean, I perhaps could include you in that. Mm -hmm. you know? Oh, I'm very alienated. Yeah, yeah. I'm forever alienated. <laughs> yes, no, you're right. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, the, the, the performance of different groups in our society is highly varied. Um, educationally, health-wise, highly varied. And the idea that you can characterise people as being in or out on the basis of their race, their culture, or their uh, religious persuasion is clearly not the right way to go. Now, um, you might be rather surprised to find that I'm finding a lot of powerful voices on the conservative side who share that view as well. And I, Eric Pickles and I have been working on this. Um, now, it's not all... Um, uh, what shall I say, good news. I mean, every, probably most Liberal Democrats in the room could say, yeah, right on, that's exactly how I feel too. Uh, I hope you do feel that anyway. Um, and so then I come to my trick question, uh, and that is, do you feel that way about the gypsies who camped at the park at the end of your street? Um, because actually, the last group in Britain that it's okay to stand at the bar and slag off in the most vicious mm -hmm. and discriminatory way mm -hmm. are gypsies and travellers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. mm -hmm. And they have the worst health outcomes of any group in this country, the worst education outcomes of any group in this country. They are denied access to financial services, and they are most commonly uh, denied access to employment. 
Uh, now, I could go on and do my gypsy and traveller stuff, but you can see that there's a real challenge because there's a sort of a cosy bit of this where we can all agree that we should live in peace and harmony and blah, 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 but we haven't actually cracked it in this country. And it isn't the Muslim community, it's the gypsy and traveller community. And uh, you only have to read the front pages of some of the newspapers to see that there are still some significant outstanding problems. I have to say, Isan, I'm not prepared to comment on the current circumstances. Um, I'm, I'm not in, in a position where I can do that. But um, I just want to really just make this, uh, you in this fringe, uh, aware of the fact that we've got a much bigger set of questions to answer and that we are working on that. We expect to be able to publish our integration and social cohesion policy paper um, probably in the next month. Um, and uh, I look forward to an opportunity to engage with the MLD at that point to, uh, to talk people through that. Um, so you might well say, well, what did he actually say at the end of all that? Has he announced anything? Has he said anything? No. No, I haven't. Um, we have got a gypsy science investment program. We're putting money into investing for uh, affordable home sites for gypsies. We have got an interministerial group drawing on <coughs> ministers from all government departments saying, uh, challenging them to say, what's your offer? What's going to be education's offer to gypsies? What's going to be the business offer, the financial services offer, uh, etc., etc. Um, and I think that's how we ought to be looking in future to develop our approach to social cohesion. And multiculturalism or integration, um, actually, of course, multiculturalism has become a demon word to some of our coalition partners. Um, and integration is a word they're having to learn quite, you know, that whatever. But actually, when you get down to what people mean or what they think they don't like about either of those concepts, actually, the things they don't like about multiculturalism, which they might say was something like developing an apartheid system, if you like, the Trevor Phillips criticism, uh, I don't think any Liberal Democrat would want either. So it's not the word, it's what lies behind the word. And if we want cohesive communities where everybody is given the opportunity to develop their capacity and their aspirations to participate fully in society, and I read Jasmine's comments, uh, uh, journalistic stuff. I haven't read any of your books, I'm so sorry to say that. But <laughs> I, 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 all of them. Yeah. I, 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 think, I think the two of us are probably on the same page. I'm about to find that out. But the, it's about making sure every individual and every community can play a full and active part in a prosperous country. And that isn't about starting off by classifying some people as troublemakers, other people as goodies and then devising policies which have that as their starting point. Thank you.